later in the service. I don't know, but I want us to get uh, into the sermon this morning. And uh, before I do that, I just have a quick word that uh, I want to mention. You know, right now in this nation, there is a lot of hatred and racism and things that are going on around the nation. And um, it's easy to get caught up in that, you know, and people try to take sides and lines and all of this stuff. But I want to read this scripture to you in 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. It says, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Let me say that again. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. What does that mean? It means you're not saved. It means you don't have the love of God in you. It means that you cannot say that you're a child of God, who, by the way, loves all people, died for all people, and say you're a child of God, yet you hate another person. Now, we're talking, I'm saying this because of the racism that's going on in our nation right now, and it's not one group. It's, it's all over the place. People think, you know, well, it's one group. No, it's not. There's a lot of racism. It doesn't matter what color you are. You can be racist. It doesn't matter. And what this is telling us is, is that if you have the love of God in you, one of the things that it will do is bring you out of hating another person. Even your worst enemy, you will love them because the love of God is on the inside of you. He goes on, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. In other words, he's saved. You can tell because of the love that's in them. They have the love of God in them. And in him there is no cause for stumbling, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is one of three times in the book of 1 John where John makes it very clear that if you hate somebody or you, just, or you, you have hatred in your heart towards another person that you're not even saved. Okay, that's not my words. That's the word of God. So I just want to say that this morning. The church should never participate or, or fall along these lines of racism. We are to rise above that and have a message of light. I don't care what color you are. It makes no difference what color you are. We are to rise above this and say, wait a minute, our eyes are on Jesus. And, and make no mistake about it. What's happening in our nation right now is not of God. It is of the devil. And the, and the divisiveness, and you can point fingers, well, this one's fault, it's this leader's fault, or this group's fault. Listen, don't, don't get focused on the particulars about it. Understand what's behind it, okay? And we're all fighting a common enemy, and that enemy is Satan. And that's why we're here, that's why we're on this planet, and we're not to get distracted about race. In Christ, there is no race. The Bible says in Christ there's not even any gender. It doesn't matter whether you're male, female, black, white, Mexican, Asian, Indian. It does not matter. You are, if you are in Christ, you are my brother. If you are in Christ, you are my sister. Skin color is completely irrelevant. Background culture, irrelevant. God surpasses all of that. And let me just tell you this. Loyalty to God and loyalty to the scripture should be more powerful than your loyalty to your race. Did you hear what I said? It doesn't matter, you know, people fall along the lines of race. Well, you know, we've got to be loyal. No, you don't. You've got to be loyal to God. You've got to be loyal to the Word of God. The, the, I'm, I'm loyal to God before I'm loyal to my own family, my blood. It, I'm loyal to God first, and that's a true sign of a believer. So don't get caught up in that, and if you sense that in you or you're hanging around people that are stirring that up in you, you better watch it. You better watch it. Because you're going to find yourself falling into something that is not of God. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we've been going through uh, a series called Road Trip. And what we've been doing is following the, the children of Israel through the wilderness. As uh, they're, they're journeying into the promised land. And we're, really, we're coming to the end of that. We're coming to the end of that now. And this is probably going to be the last sermon in that, in that series. So we've, we've started with them all the way to Egypt, and we've gone through the promised land. Last week, they, God gave them the bad news that they were going to lose the promised land, uh, those ones because of doubt and unbelief. But 
Tonight, t- today, I want to get into uh, the end of this series, and I want us to look at two great speeches that were given right before uh, all of this is sort of ending, okay? Two great speeches, and both of them are from God. It's pretty cool when you look at the Scripture that you have whole speeches from God, that God gave to his people. You know, sometimes in college and school, you have to go back and read speeches of famous people, you know, old presidents or leaders of the nation. It's pretty cool that we have speeches that God gave, and we can go back and read what God said to his people. The most important thing in your mind ought to be what God thinks about any topic, any subject, anything in your life. I want to know what God thinks first. You know, it matters, people that you respect, Uh, Friends, family, spouses, you know, leaders, it matters what they think, but what God thinks supersedes all of that. And so I I love to read these long passages of what God was saying to his people because it was not only for them, but it was it's for us. And when we read it, we can get a lot out of it and apply it today. So let's look, we're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. And these two speeches we're going to look at. The first one. God gave through Moses to the children of Israel right before they're about to go into the promised land. So he's, he's preparing them. When you go in, this type of stuff is going to happen, and I, I want to prepare you for it. The second speech was to Joshua, who was taking over uh, as leader of the nation of Israel after Moses died. So we got two speeches going on. First was to the children of Israel. First one was to Joshua as a leader about to take over that nation. So we're going to look at the first one, Deuteronomy 30:11. It said, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Let me, let me stop right there. He says, this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. In other words, all the law that I've laid out, everything that, all the rules and the commands that I've given you, they are not too hard for you to do. A lot of times we look at the Old Testament law and we think, gosh, so many rules So many things, and man could never do that. God said right here, he told them what I commanded you and the things that I gave you to do, they are actually not too hard for you to do it. (laughs) You you could have done it. But your sinfulness and your rebellion continually turned you from it. He said it's not too hard for you. This is an important thing for us to remember because if it was not too hard for the children of Israel, where does that leave us in the New Testament? Because they didn't have the same grace that we have. They didn't have the same Holy Spirit living in them, empowering them to do the will of God that we had, that we have. Yet he looked at them and said, this is not too hard for you. Don't ever look at my law and think, man, it's just so much. It's too hard. I can never do it. God said, it's not too hard for you. And if you think it's too hard, it's because you're not thinking right. Again, how many of you know God's right? We're wrong. If you think it's too hard, it's because your, li- your thoughts are not lining up with God's thoughts, and you're underestimating the ability and the God-likeness that's on the inside of you. It's not too hard. It's not too hard. Don't ever let the devil... T- you know who tells you it's too hard? The devil. It's too hard. Can't do that. Nobody's perfect. You can't follow all those things. Listen, while some of that may be true, is that what you're aspiring for? Is that what you're aspiring for? Well, nobody's perfect, and... Everybody's going to mess up and everybody's going to have problems. How about we think like God on the subject? I'd rather have my confession line up with his. And when I start feeling tempted to sin, say, you know what? This is not too hard for me. God's with me. God's ability is in me. It's not too hard. I can do this because God's on the inside of me. So God said that to his people. The commandment that I've given you, it's not too hard. Neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say who will ascend to the heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Praise God. You can do it. God said you can do it. And if you believe in anything different than that, then you've deceived yourself or you've been deceived by the enemy. Nobody in this room going forward, when you walk out of these doors, nobody going forward from this point ever, if you have God living on the inside of you, you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, nobody ever has to walk out of these doors again and sin again. You think, 
that's impossible. That standard's way too. Everybody's going to sin, right? I didn't say everybody wasn't going to. I'm just telling you, you don't have to. You don't have to. And you go, well, that's not what I've heard. Well, let's look at what God said. He's telling the children of Israel, it's not too hard. And he said, it is in your mouth. It is not far from you so that you can do it. God said, you can do it. But when we let the enemy lie and we start out in this defeated position of, well, nobody's perfect. Everybody's going to mess up. Everybody makes mistakes. Can you please find that in the word for me? Please find that in the word for me where it said, nobody's perfect, everybody's going to sin, everybody makes it. No, I know it says that we have all sinned, talk about past tense. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to be the first to tell you, don't, you don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I'm going to be the first to tell you I'm not perfect. I sin, but I'm not going to stand here when I sin and say, oh, I had to do that. I just couldn't help it. No, God said you can help it. If I sin, it's because I have sin in me and I chose not to do right. That was my choice that I made, but I didn't have to do it. And there's no excuse for it when you have the power of God living in you. Boy, we're having fun this morning. I'm telling you, everybody's getting warmed up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. In other words, everybody has experienced the same temptation that you've experienced at some point. It's not unique to you. You don't have a special situation. You don't have a special background. Well, it was my daddy's fault, my mama's fault, or I was exposed to this, all of that. Listen to what he said. There's no temptation that you've encountered that has overtaken you that is not common, common to man. Throughout every generation, going all the way back, somebody has dealt with what you're dealing with. The addiction, the pain, the problem, the heartache, the abuse. Go on down the list. Somebody's dealt with it. It's not new. He said it's common to man. But listen, God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What does this tell me? This tells me that every sin you were ever tempted to commit, you had the ability to overcome it, and there was a way of escape that was presented, but you chose not to take it. That's the word of God. Well, I, I didn't see that way of escape. You didn't want to see it. You didn't want to see it. It was right there in front of you. Why? Because nobody has to sin. So if the word of God is true, which we know that it is, if the word of God is true, then any temptation that comes before you, anytime you're tempted to sin, the Bible says God is on your side saying you have the ability, you can do it, and not only that, I am creating a way of escape for you in this moment to choose what is right. But if you're starting from a defeated place of, well, everybody's going to sin anyway, everybody's going to mess up anyway, you're not going to choose what is right because you've lied to yourself and you've let the devil lie to you and say, you have to do this. It's pretty much everybody's doing this and everybody's messing up. Why don't we go with what God said? Why don't we go and follow him and see what he said? No, I believe in this moment that I can do right. I believe that I can choose right. I believe that God is creating a way of escape for me in this moment and that I have the ability to choose what is right. If you've ever been tempted to sin... And you had the courage, the braveness, the ability to begin to speak the word of God or pray. You watch temptation just melt right before you. But most of the time we don't reach out to God. We turn to the lies that say, you have to do this. Everybody's going to do this. This is just normal. So God said, no, you can do it. He's telling the children of Israel, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you can do it. Verse 15, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Today I have set before you life and good, death and evil. In other words, I'm giving you a choice, and you're going to have to choose which path you want to take. Life and good, death and evil. If you look at what everybody is really after in this life, this, this, God is presenting to the children of Israel... He's presenting to them what everybody is after, which is the good life, a good life, blessing, success, prosperity. It's all here. We're going to read it in just a minute. 
But he says, I want you to understand something today. I'm setting before you two paths. One is going to lead to life and good. The other one is going to lead to death and evil. Most people, especially those that are far from God, they think they're going down the, life of, the path of life and good, but they're actually going down the path of death and evil. Because why? They choose the good life over God, and it leads to death and evil. So the enemy blinds it, and he, and he makes it where that you're making that choice, and you're laying your life out, and you're making decisions and choices for your life, and you think you're doing it, and it's going to lead to success and happiness and joy and the good life. It's actually going to lead to death and evil because you're not choosing God's way. You're choosing man's way. But this is God saying, I'm laying out before you two paths and two choices today, and it's 100% your choice what path you choose. Verse 16. He's going to tell us how to get the, the right path. If you obey the commandments. Everybody say if. This is huge if. This is a big if. This is a big if. This is not guaranteed every person. This was not guaranteed to every person that was part of the community of Israel. This is not guaranteed to every believer. This is a huge if. Okay? If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then... You shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. So he gives them three things. Love God, walk in his ways, and obey his rules. If you do those three things, he said, you are going to live the blessed life. Doesn't mean you're not going to have trouble. Doesn't mean you're going to have difficulty. Doesn't mean you're not going to have setbacks. But you are going to live the blessed life, and God's hand will direct your life and your life will turn out well for you when you follow God in this way. If you obey the commandments. If you, you remember when you were in school and you heard of the if-then statement? Well, I guess that was like English or something like that. I can't even remember where I learned that. The if-then statement. If you do this, then this will happen. This is an if-then statement. If you obey the commandments of the Lord that I command you by loving the Lord your God, walking in His ways, keeping His rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Many people, when they encounter God's Word, they have a warped, distorted view of God's Word. But, but here's, here's how I see God's Word. A lot of people, when they read the Word of God, they read it like God made these arbitrary rules. He doesn't like this, so he said, don't do it. He doesn't like this, so he said, don't do it. He doesn't like these you know, things, so he said, stop doing that. That's not what it is. See, <clears throat> every one of us probably came today in a, in a motor vehicle. We got here in a car, a truck, and that vehicle came with an owner's manual. Now, what was written first? What was made first, the, the vehicle or the owner's manual? The owner's manual came after to explain how the vehicle was created and how it runs best. You don't read the owner's manual and go, man, Ford really doesn't like water because they said do not put water in the gas tank, only use fuel, only use gasoline. Man, they're really harsh. Water's cheaper. I'd like to put water in my gas tank because it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot easier to come by. Man, they're just harsh. They're hard. No, they're, it's not about that. They're just telling you how it runs properly. You can reject it. You can do what you want. You can put water in your gas tank if you want to because it's cheaper or for whatever reason you come up with. The owner's manual was written to explain to you how it works. It's not harsh. It's not hard. It's not any of those things. It was a lot of rules, a lot of things. I got to check the tire pressure and do all these different things and they're just telling you how your vehicle is going to operate at the perfect level and, and at its optimum performance. It's just information about how it's going to operate. That is what we have here in the Word of God. God is telling us, I created the world. I created man. I created woman. I created relationships. I created marriage. I created joy. I created pleasure. I created all these things. I made them. I know how they work. 
And he gave us the scriptures to tell us the story and explain to us how life works, how worship works, how everything works. You can't read it and go, well, I disagree with that. Well, you can read your owner's manual and disagree if you want to, but they know how it works. It's the same thing with this. The Word of God is not to bind us. It is to set us free. And when you live according to his precepts and his rules and his laws, it's going to go well with you. Is that really what's at the heart of what's being said here? He said, if you want the good life, I'm laying it out for you. Life and good is this path. Death and evil are this path. When you follow my word, it will turn out well for you because I've designed and created the earth and I'm giving you the manual to tell you how it works. But in order to do that, <clears throat> it requires a level of humility that many of us don't have because we think that we're smart and we know things and that we can figure things out on our own and we can choose our path and do what we want to do. But you have to start with this premise, I don't know everything. I don't have the highest level of intelligence that is available. You know, I have two dogs at home. Last time I talked about my dogs, I only had one. I have two now. He's just as irritating as the first one, and maybe worse. But my dogs, they don't know what they don't know, right? I mean, my dogs are, well, one of them is halfway smart. And, you know, he can figure out a few things. He's smart for a dog. But if I go out and start talking to him about politics or about physics or about mathematics or about cell phones, or anything else. His intelligence has a cap. You take the smartest dog in the world, he's not going to understand any of those things I'm talking about. Why? Because his, his intelligence has a level. Every created thing, their, their intelligence has a cap. Okay, You take the smartest person on the planet, they only know that much about the things of God. But we don't know that, and again, you don't know what you don't know. The dog doesn't know that I'm smarter than he is. As far as he knows, we're kind of on the same level. <laughs> That's how he lives life. He goes through life just thinking, man, you know, this is a good life. We're buds and we hang out and I chase him around, you know, when he's driving his four-wheeler or whatever. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. And trust me this morning, if, you, if there's anything I've gotten from the Word of God, it is this. God's faults are higher than my faults. And his ways are higher than my ways. I don't have... My, my mind has a, has a cap, and my intelligence has a cap. And so in, in, in our relationship with God, you have to start with that premise. Every created thing, their intelligence has a cap, including yours. So there are things that you can't understand. Your mind doesn't even have the ability to understand. I'll give you one such thing. You know, to a, uh, to, to a degree, we can all understand eternity future. Like how something's just going to go on and on and on. But try to sit down and understand eternity past. How, has, how does God not have a beginning? How has there been no starting point? Your brain doesn't even have the ability to comprehend that concept, to grasp it. It's just not there. You search and search. You can't find eternity past. There had to be a beginning. There had to be something. There had to be, but we don't know. We can't grasp it. And how many such things are there that God looks at us and laughs as we spend millions of dollars trying to figure out on this project and this experiment. And he's just going, you ain't never going to get that one. You ain't never going to get that one. You don't even have the, the ability. You know, uh, my, for Christmas, my, my daughter, she loves animals. I got to tell you this story. This is funny. Uh, my daughter loves animals. And so for Christmas, her grandmother bought her, and grandfather, sorry, Bill, I'm sure both of you paid for it, but bought her two hamsters and so from the very first day that we got the hamsters you could tell that one was not of very high intelligence and the other one was a little bit smarter from day one the first the, the one that was a little smarter he ate out of the box and was running around the car like on the way home from the pet store and then once we got them in the house they're in the cage you know and we had them this nice cage with the wheels and the tunnels and everything they everything you know the little hamster paradise and the, the second one escaped from the cage a couple times. So we would wake up. He'd figured out how to pop the little lid off, and we're like, he's somewhere in the house right now. He must be somewhere in the house. And so we 
go through the whole, and my thought was set a mousetrap. We'll get the thing real easy, you know. <laughs> the kids didn't like that idea, so we didn't do that. But so he got out, and we did find him. We found him twice, found him two times. And the, first, the second time, it took like three days before we found him. So he's just having a party. You know, he's running around the house, and we'd find evidence that he'd been <laughs> places. And so we caught him. Well, the third time that he escaped, we couldn't find him. And I went outside, and this beautiful little white hamster was just laying dead in the grass. And it had rained that the previous night. So I guess he not only he got outside of the cage because it was too confining. Then he got in, the, in our house, and it was too confining. So he made his way outside. He got outside, and... It, it poured down rain that night, and all we could figure was he drowned in some puddle or something. You know, he was probably born in captivity, born in the pet store. He'd never been outside in his life. And so he didn't make it 24 hours. He was dead right there. And as soon as I saw that, I thought to myself, man, that is just how people are. They, they see the cage as confinement. They see it as God, you know, confining me, when you don't even realize that it's for your protection, that God's rules are for our protection. And that if we follow God's rules, we'll have life and good. If we reject it and we constantly go outside of that, we'll have death and destruction. It's not because God is mean. It's the way the earth has been created. Verse 17. So he tells them, if you do these things, you're going to have good. You'll be blessed. Verse 17. But if your heart turns away... And you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. This is not a threat. This is just factual information. He's telling them, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. I'm not threatening you. I'm just, I want you to know. If you do that, you will surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. I love that last line. In case you're not smart enough to figure it out, I'm going to give you a hint. Choose life. You got two choices. Life, death, blessing, cursing. Choose life. Much better. And I want to tell you this morning, if you're undecided, this morning, if you're here, you're undecided. Choose life. Choose God's way. Reject your way. Remember what we were reading during the offering message. Reject the way of the sinner, path of the scorn. Reject that, sitting, sitting in the seat of the sinner. Reject that and understand, no, there's God's way, and I want to choose life. Amen. Now, this was God's final message to them as they were going into the promised land. And shortly after this, Moses dies. He passes the torch of leadership to Joshua. And God has a powerful message for Joshua that I think we can learn from. Also, I want to look at here, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. Verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go now stop right there notice what Moses what God said to Joshua he said I want the same plan that I had for Moses is being passed to you to take these people into the promised land it's going to be a good land flowing with milk and honey land of blessing only be strong and courageous, being very careful. What does it mean to be careful? Particular, paying attention, meticulous. 
He said, be very careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Let me say this. If your boss came in your office and he handed you a piece of paper and it said, I've got seven things that I need you to accomplish today. And I want you to be very careful to do all seven of those things just like they're lined out. And he handed you that piece of paper. How many of you would take that piece of paper and actually read it? You know, not skim it. Because for your job may depend on it. Your promotion may de depend on it. Your performance may depend on it. So your boss comes in and gives you seven things. I want you to do these things. First thing you want to do is be careful to observe what he said. And, how, and if you have any questions, go back to him and say, what do you mean about this? You want to be careful to, to do what he wants to do. Why? Because he's your boss. Well, I'm amazed at how many people that say God is their boss, their Lord, but are careless when it comes to his word. Careless. When it comes to his word. Did you know that not knowing the law is not an excuse for not doing the law? How many of you ever got pulled over by a police and they said, did you know the speed limit? No, sir, I didn't. Well, it was your job to know as a motor vehicle traveling on this road to know the laws of travel. And, and you know, well, I didn't know my inspection sticker was out. Irrelevant. It's your job to know. We understand that with model law. Ignorance of the law is certainly not an excuse for not doing the law. How much more with God is ignorance of the Word of God? This is the supreme law. Okay? This is the supreme law. All of us have to pay our taxes. Unfortunately, not knowing tax law is not an excuse for not paying. If they come and investigate, you better be doing it by the book according to how the IRS expects you to do it or you will be penalized with interest. Why? Ignorance of the law is irrelevant. You, it's your job to know. If you're going to be a business owner and you're going to, you got to know. You got to e educate yourself or you got to pay someone that does know. We know this, but yet when it comes to God's law, I don't know if because we just depend on His mercy, we just depend on His grace, and we say, well, He's such a good God and He loves me anyway and He'll forgive me. So I just, I don't, you know, it's not that particular. I'd be shocked at how many people that call themselves Christians, which means we are submitted to God, submitted to His word are completely ignorant of the Word of God and don't know what's in the Word. There's so many excuses when it comes to this for not reading the Word, not studying the Word. But uh, you know what? I've, I've begun to throw those excuses out. I don't listen to them anymore. And I'll tell you why. I had an experience that changed my thought process on this forever. I'll never think about this the same way again because I pastor... Christians, and I pastor people that say they, they love God and serve God, but don't read the Word of God. And I understand, I hear the excuses. Well, it's long, there's a lot to it, I don't understand it, uh, it's boring, you hear all kind of stuff. But I don't tolerate those excuses anymore. I used to, but I had an experience that changed my life with this, and I, I, don't, I don't listen to it anymore. Because earlier this year, my nine-year-old son read the New Testament through cover to cover in 60 days. And I did not encourage him to do it. I did not ask him to do it. I never told him to do it. And I know this may sound horrible. I'm a pastor. We don't encourage our kids to read the Word of God. I don't encourage them to read the Bible because I had the thought of, well, they're going to be older. You know, when they get older, we'll, we'll probably encourage that. But he's only nine years old, so I thought, well, I'm not really encouraging that. Now, he sees us reading the Bible. And he comes to church a lot and hears about it. But I've never once encouraged him to read the Bible. Never told him he should do it. Somebody gave him a Bible at his school. One of the little, tiny Gideon Bibles that the print is so small you have to have a microscope to read it. And he just, I don't know why. I don't know what kicked into him. Probably because we pray for our kids. I, from the time they were little, we prayed for our kids that they would love the Word of God. I pray they'd love the Word of God, they'd read your Word, they'd hide it in their heart. We prayed that for them from the time they were little. I don't know what got into him. He picked up the Word of God, and he said, I'm going to read this. I didn't believe him. Then he finished Matthew. I said, man. Then he finished the Gospels. I said, man. In 60 days, every night. Now listen, this was not during the summer. This was in the school year. So he's at school during the day. When he comes home, he's got homework, doing his homework. 
Then after that, instead of watching TV or playing toys or when he laid in bed at night, he would read the Word of God. He read it consistently for 60 days, and in 60 days he finished the whole New Testament. And I thought to myself, I will never again listen to another lazy Christian come up to me and tell me they can't read the Word, they can't understand it, it's too boring, whatever, whatever. It's all just blah, 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 blah in my ear now because I watched a nine-year-old do it. And I'm just telling you, why do we accept those lies? Why do we accept those lies that we tell ourselves, well, you know, it's, it, I, I don't know what we tell ourselves, why we shouldn't be reading the Word of God. But he's telling Joshua here, Joshua, you can have good success. Choose life, but I want you to be very careful to obey my Word and to obey my law. If you're going to be careful to obey the Word of God, how many of you know the first step is knowing what it says? How can you possibly be careful to obey the Word of God when you do not even know what it says? And big news flash, it is not my job to help you know. It's not my job so that you know the Word of God. It is my job to help you as a pastor. But it is no one's responsibility but your own to know what the Word of God says. And I promise you, it is not a good enough excuse to God and say, well, you know, the pastor doesn't preach it or blah, blah, blah or whatever. It is your job to know the Word of God. It is your responsibility to know it. And you have to take responsibility for yourself for that. So he tells Joshua, be careful, be careful to do according to all the law of Moses. Do not turn from it. This, listen how particular. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. In other words, don't deviate from it one bit. Just take what it says Grasp it, believe it, apply it, but don't deviate, not one bit, not from the right to the left. You know, you get all these people and they, they, they break it down and they, study and they try to explain it away. Well, he didn't really mean that or he didn't really mean this and that or the other. In order to excuse away sin or a particular type of lifestyle, he said, do not do that. Be careful to obey. Don't deviate to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. You see, this is what everybody's after. And the God who created everything is telling you how to get it. He, he gave us a secret. It's all right here. He told us how to get what everybody is after in their life. Good success. Happiness. He said, be careful to do the word. Don't deviate right or left. Are we doing this? I, I wonder if we're doing this. I mean, do you look at the word of God like this? Look at what he said in verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. He's serious about this. He said everywhere you go, every day of your life, the Word of God ought to be on your lips. You ought to be talking the Word of God. You ought to be thinking the Word of God. You ought to be sharing the Word of God. You ought to be discussing the Word of God. Not just when you're at church. Not just when you're at life group. You ought to have people in your life that you can talk the Word Pray the word, believe the word, hide the word in your heart. He said, meditate on it day and night. Are we doing that? Are we doing that? Because I think a lot of people come to church once or twice a month, and they hear an hour and a half sermon, and that's all the word they're getting. Now, that's not everybody. But I think some people, that's the relationship they have with the word of God, is I come to church, I get a little bit of word once or twice a month, and that's, that's about my extent of the Word of God that I get. That is not anywhere close to what he's talking about here. That's, that is so far off base from what he's talking about. He told him, be careful to do it. Don't let it depart from your mouth, your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Think the Word. Talk the Word. Read the Word. Pray the Word. Discuss the Word. It ought to saturate our lives and our thoughts and our speech. It ought to be first place in everything that we do. Everything we're trying to decide whether we do or whether we don't do it, it ought to be first examined under the Word of God. What does the Word say about this? You know, if I'm about to have this conversation, or I'm about to take this course of action, or I'm about to do this at work or job, it ought to be taken under the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about this? You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do 
according to all that is written. So he tells us why he's telling us it should never leave your mouth and you should meditate on it day and night. There's one reason, so that you may be careful to do, to do it. See, we don't talk the word, listen to the word, get preached the word just so we can get smarter, just so we can know it. He said, there's a reason why I'm telling you to talk it and meditate on it. It's so that it leads to your obedience, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Amen. Praise God. Now, in closing, I want to look at this. Did this generation that God was talking to, did they do this? Did they listen to what he was saying and, and did they obey it? Did they take it to heart? Well, that generation that heard it actually did. That generation, remember, the, the, the generation that came into the wilderness all died off. They were rejected from the promised land because they would not follow God and obey him. They would not believe. And so they all died off, but their children is who he's talking to right here. And these, this is the generation that went into the promised land. And for that generation, yes, they actually did follow the Lord. Listen in Judges chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years old. Verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And so you read through the book of Judges and you see this pattern of rebellion against God and his word, his law. The destruction that comes as a result of that. They come to their senses, they repent, and then God rescues them. This is a pattern you see over and over. Every, there's, the book of Judges is, takes place over several hundred years. And you see that. Rebellion, destruction, repentance, restoration. Then it starts over. Next generation comes up. Rebellion, destruction, repentance, restoration. Happens over and over and over again through the book of Judges, you read about it. And where are we at in that? You know, are we going to be that generation that follows God, obeys the commands of God? Or are we going to be that generation that rejects God and reaps the consequences of it? If I look at where the nation is headed right now, it's 50-50. It's I don't know yet. We don't know what's going to happen. Because I think that by and large, if you look at it across the board, this nation is rejecting God. And we're rejecting his word. But all I know to tell you is this. In every generation throughout scripture, there were always a group of people that held fast to God and his word. And it doesn't, so it doesn't matter whatever's happening around us, what direction the nation's going, what direction your family's going. You've got to be that person to stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will follow his word. We will obey his word. We'll be committed to to God. I believe that this church is called to that. There might be other churches that are focusing on different things and, and going a different way, and we love them, we pray for them. We're not, you know, we're, we're all partners in trying to accomplish the will of God. But I believe that in this day and age that we live in, when there's so much deception and so many lies going on on so many topics, you better know what the Word of God says about it, or else you're susceptible to being deceived on it and therefore not obeying it. I can't believe some of the things that come out of Christian people's mouths that call themselves Christians and, and say they serve the Lord, which by default they should know his word and his law. And they say, well, I don't see anything wrong with this or that or the other. Well, I don't really, I'm not trying to be rude. I don't really care whether you see anything wrong with it. The question is, what does God see in it? And that ought to be your only thought. And that's just the issue. I don't see anything wrong with it. There's a reason for that. You don't see anything wrong with it because you're not seeing the Word of God. 
and you're not putting it in your heart and you're not meditating on it. You're seeing through the eyes of the flesh and you're seeing through the eyes of the enemy rather than seeing through the word of God. But we're called as a generation to reject the world and the culture's way of thinking and say, I only want to know what God thinks and that's what I'm going after. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning.